Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. It's more than more than is warranted, really. Uh, I um, <clears throat> want to thank the organizing committee for for inviting me, and it's it's interesting to see how many connections there are with with various things. I want to focus uh, as much as I can on on, on glycosylation uh, and glycosides. This is uh, fits in mostly with our <clears throat> Uh, drug development uh, schemes, which I, which I won't really talk about today, but uh, the, essentially these are starting materials to make glycopeptide pharmaceuticals. But uh, glycosylation, if you're not too familiar with it, uh, you, you have a donor, you have an acceptor, or you typically an alcohol or another sugar, uh, a promoter, uh, and they're, they're usually called promoters rather than catalysts because you need a lot of them, uh, and a solvent. And the, the, the tricky part is that all four of these components really have to be optimized and work together to get effective glycosylations. Uh, and and there's, there's really no such thing as a universal conditions. And so you work out conditions for one glycosylation, the next one may or may not be uh, useful to you. Uh, and since, since the theme is past and present, I thought it would be appropriate if I talked a little bit about the, the past way that we did this sort of thing. And, and, uh, and I think the, <coughs> the, the sad part is that a lot of people are still doing it this way, and, you know, and, and I guess you have to sometimes. Um, but uh, we've got, um, uh, we started doing this back in the, in the early 90s when I sort of started drifting away from the uh, total synthesis of natural products community, which uh, uh, which 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 I was trained in. Uh, but in in the old days, and the old days weren't that long, far long ago, uh, you used a uh, a uh, some sort of activated glycosyl donor. Uh, this Koenig's nor type intermediate's been known since about 1910. Um, uh, and, and, and there, there are others, of course, but, but the point is you have to make a, a, a fairly reactive glycosyl donor, something that's, that's unstable, and of course the more, the more reactive it is, the less stable it is. And, and us chemists, we're really kind of schizophrenic, right? We want everything to be stable at room temperature and put in a bottle, but then we want it to react at minus 78 in 10 seconds, uh, which of course are impossible. Uh, impossible to get to get both of those. Uh, the really sad part about glycosylation is that you typically use a, a toxic metal salt to, to catalyze the reaction. Silver, in this case, this is the um, Hennessian modification of the koenigs nor reaction, which uses silver triflate. Surprisingly, the triflic acid costs more than the than the uh, silver, uh, but then there are mercury salts and other types of uh, helferish reaction, for example. And so, so typically these are not fun to use, and you have to use more than, more than an equivalent. Some of them are actually quite explosive as well. Uh, the alcohol moiety is just an alcohol, but uh, because of the high reactivity of the donor, you typically have to mask other competing groups, other alcohols or carboxylates, this sort of thing. And uh, so we, we use some tricks where we, we uh, activate our hydroxyl with a, with a favorable hydrogen bond uh, in this case. But, uh, and then the solvent uh, system. Uh, and a lot of times these solvents are done in the presence of molecular sieves. Uh, these are not there just to remove water from the reaction, but they actually provide a two-dimensional surface on which your reaction can occur. Uh, and you say, well, why, why is that a problem? Well, if you start putting these things into large reactors, uh, it limits your scale. And a lot of engineers don't really like putting sand, essentially sand, in their, in their reactors because it, it, it abrades everything. So there's a lot of reasons to, to get rid of molecular sieves. Uh, our uh, chemistry, the stuff that we did to, uh, uh, that I did to get tenure basically, was to, to introduce this uh, uh, hydrogen bond here, which enhances the nucleophilicity of the neighboring alcohol, 
and makes, uh, makes these things more reactive. On the other hand, if you have a, a typical nitrogen protecting group like a CBZ or, or a FMOC, you actually stick this hydrogen bond uh, in there that's unproductive. It actually reduces the nuclear felicity of your hydroxyl group. So this is the way we, we did this some time ago. Uh, a great example here is this, this dipeptide uh, in which you can get a, uh, perhaps this is a non-neutral uh, uh, hydrogen bond, but anyway the hydroxyl group is free enough or maybe it hydrogen bonds to this carbonyl. But we could get very good yields using the uh, beta paracetate here. Uh, and so this was, the, I think, the first advance we made uh, since our initial work, uh, and that was, that was in 2010. We used microwave heating, uh, and here we were using um, more than one equivalent of boron trifluoride, but we're reasonably satisfied with this 86% uh, yield. Uh, and we made a number of these compounds, uh, and I think you, you see the problem here. Uh, even though we get good glycoside formation, remember we have to uh, uh, deprotect this, deprotect this, reprotect this, and then we're set to, to use these as, uh, uh, as amino acids in, uh, in peptide synthesis. Uh, so there's a lot of steps in there, and of course we've already heard that less is more in, in, in terms of steps. Uh, so what we really want to have is a truly catalytic system uh, and where we can use inexpensive, readily, readily available glycoside donors. And that's where we've, uh, uh, I think, made a, a contribution here that we, we, th th that's actually quite useful. So here we're using uh, the donor is just the beta paracetate, which is typically regarded as an intermediate, more than a, a reactive uh, glycosyl donor. The promoter, uh, in this case, is indium-3 salts, uh, acceptor, and then solvents, um, which we still haven't made as much progress in this area as we'd like to, but, you know, we can't do everything all at once. But the point is, we can make uh, 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 environmentally friendly surfactants. Um, uh, the, these sorts of things are actually, actually quite, quite useful in, in items of commerce, surprisingly. Um, we uh, started looking at, for, for different Lewis acids, uh, you remember I, I said we started with boron trifluoride, and if we took uh, this model uh, acceptor here, then we could, we could see we could get reasonable yields of this with scandium triflate uh, with different, different paracetates here, the uh, glucose, galactose, xylose, or uh, uh, lactose, uh, and very very decent yields. But here, we're, everything is one to one here. One equivalent of acceptor, one equivalent of, of donor, one equivalent of promoter, and this looked pretty good. But then, if we tried to take uh, that percentage of uh, uh, of, of uh, triflate down, tried to make this catalytic. Uh, we did get some product, but we saw larger and larger amounts of byproduct here. So the, uh, the reaction is not what we would call truly catalytic. And of course this, this comes because you have the, uh, these orthoester type intermediates or something that wants to become an orthoester. And if the nucleophile attacks here, of course you get the desired beta glycoside. If it attacks here, you get an orthoester, which typically falls apart during workup or rearranges to put the acetate on your uh, acceptor molecule here. And uh, that's, uh, well, it's not productive, is it? Um, and, but even though this is uh, uh, sort of messy, it's not that messy. If you look at the two uh, uh, chromatograms here, you can see we, we basically get a pretty clean mixture of three products. The, the desired paracetate glycoside here is number three. You get the acetate transfer here, number two. And then this, this uh, deacetylated 
product here, number one. And so even though we go from uh, one equivalence down to 0.5 or 5 percent, you still get uh, the, those same three by, byproducts and not much else. And that's that's reasonably good. Well, we, we looked around the periodic table, and I wish I had known about the, the green periodic table. We just had a regular white one. But these are all the metals that we looked at, uh, you know, and I, I think you can guess, you know, boron trifluoride, silicon tetrachloride, uh, tin tetrachloride, and so on, zinc dichloride. And it was when we were working our way across the uh, uh, post-transition metals here that we realized that the lanthanide contraction, and that led us to scandium, which we thought was, well, that's the ultimately contracted lanthanide, right? Uh, and, and then we, we realized what, what we really want here is not a great Lewis acid. We want a really crummy Lewis acid. We want a Lewis acid that is minimally competent, that's strong enough to do the reaction we want, but not strong enough to do side reactions. And that's when we started using indium and then ultimately bismuth. Uh, and so let me show you the results that we get with, with indium, for example. So now uh, we've, we, we've got our beta paracetate here, and, and I think <clears throat> you know, this suggests that the beta is going to be better than alpha. Uh, we've got FMOC protection here, and then the easily cleavable benzyl uh, ester, uh, a mixture of methylene chloride and toluene as a solvent, indium tribromide. We get the desired material. Now we're only one step away. We just have to cleave that benzyl group to get to uh, something we can put into a peptide synthesizer. So two minutes, one, uh, one equivalent, 90% yield. If we go to half an equivalent, then it extends our reaction time. And then if we drop it down further, we can go all the way down to 1% uh, indium tribromide, and we still get very good yields of the desired product. So this seems to meet our equivalent, our, our, our uh, uh, desire to have, to have minimally competent uh, Lewis acid. And I, I should point out here, the chloride doesn't work, the triflide, triflate doesn't work, the iodide sort of works, but not as good as the bromide. Um, and we only used the bromide because the chloride wasn't available. And so there's an element of, of luck here involved in the sense that we just happen, you know, if, if we had used the chloride instead of the the bromide, we probably would have just moved on to the next metal. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a very rugged terrain when you start traversing this glycosylation uh, uh, pathway, if you want to, want to think of it that way. Uh, so here you can see if we go a step further in our step of, uh, t towards minimalism, if we remove the, the ester group here, we can actually get very nice yields of the uh, desired uh, product here. This compound can be isolated without any chromatography, just a simple extraction and crystallization. I, I wouldn't call it cr crystallization, precipitation would probably be the right, the right way to think about this. So this m notion of minimal competency, what, is it, what are we really saying here? Well, if you have a, a very strong uh, Lewis acid, it's going to hold on uh, to that acetate. And you're you're going to generate a uh, something that's that's equivalent to a to a mineral acid on the other hand if you have a a poor or weak lewis acid it's going to let go of that acid acetate and the strongest bronsted acid you're going to have is is acetic acid and that leads us to the explanation of the true catalysis of course you have to pull off this this acetate uh, we actually can use alpha if if these are trans like this, this is uh, ram ramnos, uh, and, and you generate this acid, protic Ronstadt acid, at the, as the reaction proceeds, mm -hmm. but it stops right there um, in the case of the stronger uh, Lewis acids. On the other hand, the weaker Lewis acids allow you to get a true catalytic cycle going here, and uh, that works pretty well. Um, the, uh, as I said, bismuth-3 salts seem to work pretty well as a triflate, and uh, we've made a number of uh, 
of these uh, rhamnocytes, or rhamnolipids, uh, and of course these, they look like this, and then you can separate these two very easily, and then add a second uh, group on like this. These are very useful in complexing metals, as we just heard, and uh, the point here is to do extraction of, uh, of metals, and, and initially we we're looking at radioactive waste, uh, where you actually do want to recover the uh, recover the material, and just point out here how much e easier it is to do this. Now we just take a, a something like lactose, peracylate it, and then we can glycosylate it, and we're done. Yeah, I'm I'm keeping track of this stuff. Uh, uh, the head group dynamics. I don't want to really go into the into this, uh, we, we don't really have time to go into this, but, but you can produce a number of different surfactants with different properties that uh, bind to different things. Probably of more interest to this crowd is where these sh sugars come from. Uh, we actually like cellobios, which we get from, from cellulose uh, using a very old procedure. Um, do I actually give you this? The citation, yeah. Anyway, the 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 point is, this is this is almost like cooking. You just warm up the cellulose in a in a uh, uh, this brew at 42 degrees, but not 48, and you let it sit there for three or four days, and you can get very large amounts of of the uh, cellobios. Uh, we can isomerize that and then glycosylate it, and then cleave it. So in two steps, we can make these. Uh, these kinds of things. We can work with mellobios. Uh, mellobios comes from legumes. Of course, uh, uh, this is uh, important uh, because it's, it causes flatulence, I guess, and, and it's one of those sugars that's, that can cause problems for certain people. Uh, you can certainly cleave it this way to get uh, mellobios, which is what we use it for uh, to, make, to make other sorts of of glycosides. One of my students actually went out and started a company called Glycosurf and strangely enough he can make this stuff in really big really big reactor for, for, for at least for us what is a really big reactor and people buy it from him. It's really remarkable. Um, uh, I want to th thank the people that did this. Uh, uh, this is Cliff Koss who's, who started Glycosurf and uh, uh, this guy over here um, Laos uh, Sabo is a, more than a postdoc, but a guy who's been with me for about 20 years now. And I'm going to quit at this point and uh, open up for questions. Right. So we could probably take one question if anybody does have a question for the doctor. Anybody? Who's got it? Okay. No question, just a brief comment. We have in Vienna a group uh, of Professor Schmidt. He's also working with indium uh, mediated reactions Richard, uh, Richard with glycosylations, Schmidt. and he's adding, uh, he's making an, an allyl uh, addition to the carbonyl uh, or to the, to the position one of the, uh, the carbohydrates. Probably we can discuss a little bit and I can this make is a contact Richard, Richard for you. R. Schmidt. Uh, uh, no, that is Walter Schmidt in, in Vienna. Oh, okay, I don't know him. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.